Today we're going to talk to one of the industry insiders with Practice Management Software. The top challenges that you're having and what you need to know about it. Stay with us. Hi folks, I'm Sean Crabtree. And I'm Cameron Bailey. Welcome in to Growth Profits. Coming to you live each week. We don't want to change the way you do business. We want to change the way you're thinking about your business. We want you to have better results, happier clients, and make more money. Let's get it started. Welcome into Dental Profits, the show that is all about you having happier clients, better results, making more money, and enjoying the ride. I am so happy to have the director of Edison Dental, the top guy when it comes to practice management software, Mr. Rusty Bradbury. And I'm telling you, um, you need to settle in and watch this. This guy is amazing. I've met lots of people in my 20 plus years in dentistry. Um, from all over the spectrum. Rusty, I'm just going to go ahead and compliment you. Rusty has the ability, and I've told him this before, but I've never said it on camera. Rusty is one of these unique people that has the ability to be both left-brained and right-brained, and I think you're going to see that um, in this video. Very rarely do you get the opportunity to meet somebody who has both charisma and intelligence at the highest level. Now, I've never been accused personally of having either one of those, but I'm so happy that, that, that Rusty is here with us. Rusty, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Sean. Thanks for having me. Man, I appreciate you jumping on here. I know you guys have a lot going on. I know you're busy. There's so, so many things that, that, that I'm anxious to jump into. As you know, the, the listeners and viewers of this uh, podcast are all over the spectrum, right? There are young guys who are just getting in. They're, they're guys who have been at it for a while, and, and there are doctors who are on the tail end of their career when it comes to the dentistry. Practice management software is such a big, hairy, gnarly issue, and I'm so happy to have you as the guy to, uh, to walk us through some of those things. But before we do that, okay, I want to tell the viewers just a little bit about how you and I got together. Okay. Um, you know... I was, we, we were in a, a mutual meeting and I was complaining about the issues that I've seen over the last 20 years with the practice management softwares. And I was complaining specifically about the fact that these softwares, all the big ones seems like, seem like to me that they were not developed with any sort of business acumen whatsoever. There's no common sense built into it uh, from top to bottom. And that's how the conversation with you and I got started. And then I got to know sort of what you do and, and all about, you know, what you bring to the table. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and how you got started. Well, it's, uh, that might take a while. I don't know how much time we have. But <laughs> I'll give, I'll give you the how much bourbon one. do you have in the cup? That's what I want to know. You got enough? <laughs> we're doing okay. <laughs> you got enough for the whole story? Yeah, I just filled it up, so we're good. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I didn't endeavor to get into the business of dentistry um, per se, but uh, it kind of was a long story in that uh, I moved out to Colorado about 25 years ago to pursue uh, my passion of fly fishing and skiing. I took a year off from business, right? I'd spent <laughs> 10 years as a business analyst uh, in a software development company that we made software for the life insurance and mutual fund business. And it was, you know, as you can imagine, it was quite the grind, uh, but I got a lot of unique uh, background into mostly interfacing with customers and then interfacing with developers and trying to deliver, uh, you know, a product that would meet both their expectations. Right. So anyway, I took a break from that, moved out to Colorado, uh, made some friends. And one of the friends I made was, uh, happened to be a dentist and we were out one night having a couple of cocktails and he started to complain to me about this, that, and the other. And I told him, well, you know, maybe I could help you out. And one of the things he said to me was, you know, I spent about $900 a month with my accountant just doing bookkeeping. And I kind of looked at him and like, hundred dollars a month is a lot of money. Um, maybe we should take a you know look at that because why? You know, right. Exactly. I mean, it's bookkeeping, right? You don't need to pay somebody nine hundred dollars a month to do to balance your checkbook, which is essentially what you know what was going on. So I helped him out, got him accounting software set up. Next thing, next no, he's got a friend. His friend had a friend, and before I knew it, uh, I was spending less time on the slopes and in the fly fishing streams, and I was in dental offices setting up accounting systems and doing that. So. To make a long story short, that's how I got into the, into the the dental business. It's but your and your MBA is your MBA is in uh, is in economics and finance. Correct. Well, and so that's how you went from one. That's how you bridged the gap, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So I mean, obviously, a lot of a, a lot of accounting involved. You know, I, you know, when you're when you're young and you watch the movie Wall Street, you know, you decide, hey, maybe that's what I want to do, get my MBA, and so on and so forth. But uh, that didn't work out for me. Uh, so <laughs> here I am, right? So twenty one years in dentistry. Yes, dude, we're yeah, getting just, old, Rusty. Yeah, I know. I know. So yeah, uh, technology has evolved unbelievably in that amount of time in terms of you know what i what we can do in, in the dental office and things like that so 21 so started... years in dentistry i mean it's uh it's going by just like that you've seen a lot of changes over the years i mean i can still remember before software dude i can remember the big giant green book in oh, dentistry right, right. I, that was the schedule. An office a couple of weeks ago that still had one so. are you serious okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah yeah, still scheduling out of a book, even though they had software, they didn't trust it. I'm like, okay. So, but yeah, no, I, when I, my first few dental offices that I worked with, I mean, it's so long ago. I mean, they had DOS based uh, practice management. Oh my software. gosh. Yeah. I right. mean, you know, it was, it was unbelievable. So, so, so Rusty, there's, there's a lot, like I said, there's people on all ends of the spectrum here and in the middle. Um, everybody has issues, concerns, and challenges with their software. Sure. You're the guru. I mean, you are the director, and that's what I'm going to start calling you from here on out, Mr. Director. Um, you're the director. Uh, you know, I recently sat in on one of your courses, The Business of Dentistry, and I got to tell you, I was, I was blown away. Um, I was blown away that the, the business acumen uh, is common sense thrown into sort of what it is that you guys do. Right. Um, but, but, but before we go there, I want to I stick to our topic because you and I can go all over the board here. Um, tell me, there are a handful of things that you see all over the place that are the biggest issues. And whether I'm just starting out and I don't have my software, I'm going to be looking for software. Whether I'm in that mid-stage and I am fed up to hear with my software because it won't do what I need it to do or whether I'm on the tail end of this thing and I'm ready to upgrade. What are the challenges that you see with most practice management softwares? And what are the things that we need to know about that? I can tell well, you my I, challenges, but I'm gonna let you talk first. Okay. Well, if I had to boil them down to the, you know, the biggest things that used to frustrate me in my consulting capacity, um, first was just the way um, they were designed to be used by the user interface. Um, one of the things that the flow, always, in other words, absolutely the, the user workflow. experience, right? The user experience. And that's exactly what we call it, Sean, the user experience. Um, you know, when you're in the dental office, I don't have a specialist at the front desk that answers this, you know, insurance calls and one that manages patients and one that manages the schedule, right? I usually have one person that's got to do all of those things, got to wear all those hats. Uh, the problem with most software is, is that once I start down a path, whether I'm using, you know, processing an insurance payment, or I'm working on a treatment plan, phone rings, I need to switch gears. They are really, really rigid in that once I start doing this, that's what I'm doing. Um, the software didn't help me. It didn't anticipate that I was going to need to do something else and then come back to this. So my options were I could open up windows, I could minimize them, I could close them. If I was doing a bulk check, I wasn't doing anything else. Um, and we used to literally put two computers at the front desk so that when I was in the middle of a right a, a rigid <laughs> task and I needed to answer the phone and look at the schedule, I'd go over to the other computer to do that. So I always thought, wait, this isn't how work flows uh, in the dental office. And almost every software I've ever seen, it's precisely the way they work. Single point of focus, everything's presented in a window that it doesn't help me manage. And as a user, it's up to me to manage what I'm doing. I have to close, I have to go backwards to get back to screens, just to get menus, to go somewhere else. Really, really inefficient. And you could tell they really just have never worked in a dental office because that's not how the work flows. Right, right. So no, that was my totally big right. thing that I was always like, why do I have to close all these windows just to get back to the menu so I could go find another patient's chart or go run a different report, that kind of thing. And so, and so when you developed Edison, I mean, it, that's not even an issue. That's where we started from is like, how do we build something that's got, that manages tasks and, and flows more like work actually flows through the dental office. And so that was kind of where we hung our hats. Like, let's solve that problem first. Then we can get into the other pieces of practice management administration that we really wanted to go after. Awesome. What else? So, uh, accounting, inadequate accounting. Uh, as accounting guy, <laughs> one of the things that used to really frustrate me is how they managed 
is simple things like processing payments and processing credits, um, line item accounting. Most softwares don't even do line item accounting in that I get a payment in, I process it. I, if it's an insurance payment, I'll probably distribute it to the services they belong to. Otherwise, I'm probably just applying it to an account. Um, I don't know precisely what I'm paying for, with which services. Then when the patient calls, you know, after they get their statement three months later and says, why do, why do I owe this money? I don't know. I'm going to go back and get my highlighters and rulers out because it's going to take me a while to figure out precisely where this balance goes. <laughs> that, literally that's do. really true. <laughs> we, we would literally be, you know, printing out the ledger and going through and trying to marry credits and debits so we could arrive at why this balance is what it is. And so we were determined when we, when we built Edison, that that was not going to be the case, that we were going to do true line item and accounting uh, allows me to not only instantly give you a detailed analysis of why your balance is what it is, but more important things from a practice administration standpoint, running an accounts receivable by provider, being able to go in and run a collections report and breaking it down by which provider was associated with it. Because those are, believe it or not, difficult to do in a lot of softwares, especially so, I've seen a trend okay. where- so, so, so you're hitting my wheelhouse and you and I have had this okay. conversation uh, over cocktails many times, um, you know, this is one of my biggest challenges. I, and I think the thing that, 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 that is a little concerning is that there are people who are listening to this that may not even fully understand what you just said. And I think, unfortunately, that is the case uh, the majority of the time. Um, when you talk about accounts receivable, I don't want to brush over that because that is a big, fat, gnarly issue. And... You need to tell me if what you've run into with these other softwares is not the case. Because here's what I've run into in the last 25 years. Here's what I've run into. When I, when I ask an office, what is their accounts receivable? And they print up a report. There's no, there's no straightforward. Here's what the number is. There is debits rolled in there there's credits rolled in there it's all thrown into one and then down at the bottom is a net number rusty you've got an accounting background how can you have in some cases just to point this out if, if, if you're driving down the road listen to this and you go back to your software and you run this report at the bottom of the page it'll show current is this over 30 is this over 60 over 90 whatever okay and you look at those numbers one of them will say, okay, over 60, negative $14,000. How is it possible to have a negative accounts receivable? Now, I'm being serious here. If I'm a dentist, I may not fully understand that. But as a business guy, as an accounting guy, seriously, how can you have a negative accounts receivable? Right. I mean, it's, you know, it's a liability. I mean, it's essentially an account balance that has gone negative. And this, I typically see it manifest itself this way. Uh, we, we took patient payment for a service. We were expecting insurance to pay this. Insurance paid more. Now I've overpaid for that service. Now account balance has a credit balance. Um, typically, that's what you'll see. Um, that but but it doesn't thing. tell and the then, whole story. It doesn't tell the whole story. Because in my analogy, okay, if I print this report and it's got all of these patients and they all net out and then down at the bottom it says over 60, negative $14,000. Okay, that's not possible. <laughs> it's, it's not possible, right? I'd certainly have my concerns if I saw that. Yes. I, I mean, I mean, if I, so, so, so on a patient level, on a single patient basis, if I've got patient Rusty Bradbury and uh, that situation that you just threw out there is the case, it's very possible that maybe we they paid more or whatever, okay? And there's so Rusty may have a credit balance. Right. But unless you've got every single patient along the way, in other words, it's just not possible. What the software what, what that report is actually telling you is that you've got you've got you've got you've got, you know, you know, twenty four thousand dollars that's right. owed to you, right? You've got maybe uh you know what? I can't do the math on that. I'm trying to throw an analogy out here, and I can't even do the math. But you got four, you got twenty four thousand dollars owed to you, and you've got right. one and a half times that that is in credits, and so you have a negative credit balance. Right. But it doesn't work that way. And I'm right. not sure I'm explaining that really well. But the way I try to explain it to doctors is, if if you as the doctor owe me fifty dollars, and I owe Rusty a hundred dollars, okay. Then if the doctor owes me $50 and I owe you $100, what's my accounts receivable? Right. 
Well, my accounts receivable is still $50 because the doctor owes me $50. But the way that nets out, it shows like I'm owed nothing. It shows like I have a credit balance of $50 because I owe Rusty a hundred. Well, a lot of times they're, you know, they they take the approach like for looking at a balance sheet, right? Here's my liabilities. Here's my assets. And the two net out to this amount. Yeah, but if I'm trying to figure out what my accounts receivable is, I don't know. I don't want to know what the net is. I want to know what the AR is. <laughs> no, no question. So if I'm working my AR, everyone don't care about my credits. I need to know who exactly. owes me money. And that's what I need to work. So you, two things, Sean. One, your software needs to obviously let me be able to produce that list however I want to see fit. I want to see just my debit balances. I want to see them in a, you know, by aging, by dollar amount, right? Highest number of dollars first. So I can hunt elephants instead of mice, that exactly. kind of thing and run my credits. If I want to go, you know, what I typically see is that credit balances are the accumulation of small credits over years. Patient didn't come back or my software didn't even tell me they had a credit, a credit balance. And we kept on processing services, collecting money and this credit never got dealt with. Um, and so over time, Right, I'm like credit balance grows. Like this guy's had a five dollar credit balance for twelve years. I'm probably not going to send him a check at this point. So I'm going to clean that stuff up. So that's what and, I see. And, and if it's not cleaned up, and if you don't have the ability to remove that, then when you run the report, all you end up looking at, and I and I think these doctors run into this a lot. They don't look at the over the current, the over thirty, over sixty, over ninety. They go right to that total over there, and that total says. Forty thousand dollars, right? But really, they've got all these credits thrown in there. That forty over years, in some cases, like you're saying, and so that forty thousand dollars is cash receivable. Really, is more like in some cases, one hundred and ten. Right. We we see that a lot, but they don't realize it because they're not diving into it, and the reports are not 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 to uh, just totally gripe about this, but the reports <laughs> the reports are not straightforward. Right, right. And that's one of the things that, that, that you and I have had conversation after conversation about. You guys yeah. don't have that challenge. Well, as you know, Sean, you know, in, in my business of dentistry course that I did in, in our conversations, I'm a big believer in, um, you know, looking at dentistry from a profitability factor, right? The big factors, production, collection efficiency and overhead management. And so I've always been a huge proponent of not just having an AR that's straightforward, but having one that you know, allows you to actually do things. It's interactive. I That's can the whole in, point. Filter it. To be it able so to do stuff. Me. Exactly. Right. I don't want to look at a report and say, all right, let's resort it another way. I want to be able to go into my AR into an interactive screen and go, by the way, give me everybody that has a patient balance due over 60, you know, over 60 days old. Give it to me now. Present that list at a, with a click of a button. No go, credits. Great. No credits. Just everybody with a balance at, at this level. Great. All right. Now send every single one of them a statement right now with a single button click. Those are the kind of tools that I always believe that I needed to have to effectively manage. Because, you know, I'm a big collection efficiency guy. We manage Collection claims. efficiency is my new word, and I got that from you. <laughs> collection, collection efficiency. Claims management, accounts receivable management, right? As you know, I, you know my famous saying, I cannot pay any bills with production. With productivity, with, that's I right. I can't pay with collections. Now, I, I got to have one way. before the other, but I need two. And, and, and we were determined to hey, let's build some actual tools so I can go in and not just see my AR, but I can position it in a way that's more meaningful. And then once I get it where I, when I see what I want to see, let's do something with it. You know, <laughs> click a button and boom, those statements go out, that kind of thing. This is this, what you're talking about, Rusty, and I know you and I have had this conversation before. This, this speaks to the very heart and the very challenge of everything that we run into on a daily basis. And as you can tell, it gets me a little bit fired up. I've run <laughs> into this for 25 years. It, what you say is absolutely the truth. If I own my business, forget the fact that it's in dentistry. Whatever the business is, if I own my right. business, I want to run these reports to be able to tell me where I need to focus my efforts. And if I don't have, and this is the challenge, if I don't have those reports in a way that gives me the knowledge, I don't know where to focus my effort. And so right. it compounds the issue that you're talking about. When you talk about collection efficiency, and I totally stole that word from you, uh, I'm going to use that. I have found all these years that I've been doing this that most doctors put way too much focus on profitability, or excuse me, on production. Right. And they don't put enough focus on collection. And I think part of the issue is they don't have a good understanding of where their accounts receivable is and where the collection really is. Um, you know, they look at that AR report and the number looks really small, 
because all the credits are thrown in. And in some cases, you can put the parameters in there to pull them out, but it doesn't really pull them out. And the only way you can really, we run into this a lot. The only way I can really find out a, a potential client's accounts receivable is to pull all these reports and, like you said, get out the measuring stick and pull out the calculator. I got to cross reference them, I got to highlight them. Sandra, you know, is ready to kill me sometimes because she's got six of these things that she has to stack up and you can't be interrupted because you got to remember where you were. Where's the highlighter here? You got to cross reference everything, take all the credits out and add them back in to be able to figure what, out what the AR is. And it's perpetuating this concept of if I'm just producing, I got to be making money. Right. Check my production, check my bank account. I'm good. So and, 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 it's a logical place to start, right? I mean, we obviously have to start with production, uh, but at the end of the day, and I've had this conversation with many a dentists, John, production is great. How much of that production are you putting in the bank? And then we get into a gray area real quick. It's like, well, I'm not sure. Uh, I told you my favorite, my famous story about Dr. J, right? So I did consulting with Dr. J. Uh, Dr. J is a doctor in, in Colorado. He's about 6'11", 6'10", 6'11". Uh, that's and if he's listening to this, he's a really Dr. good guy. He's a great guy. <laughs> still friend, still friend of mine. And, uh, but uh, you know, I'll never forget. I walked to his office and, and he slapped me on the back and said, man, I had my best month ever last month. You know, I really hit it hard. And he's talking about production. And I said, great, that's awesome. And then I went and, you know, crunched my numbers and I came back and, you know, he had produced, he had, had a great production month. His collections for the month were significantly less than they had been in previous months and way below what he had produced. In fact, his collections were less than his overhead for the month. So he literally had, you know, from a, yeah, had was upside down two or three grand. From a the, profitability standpoint. Absolutely. Not right. And I, and I said, and he came out and he's like, ah, I'm looking for a pat on the back. And I said, ah, Dr. J, if you have any more best months ever, you're going to be bankrupt. And he literally just looked at me. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so, yeah, I hear you. Well, that, that is a huge sticking point with me. And, and again, it's not because it's as simple as the report is not clear. It's more than that because it plays into me as the business owner, my ability to put my focus, my efforts on what is going to get me to that profitability. Absolutely. And when it looks like my AR is, you know, is, is not a big issue, then I get, I'm naturally focusing on the productivity. And it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it didn't take you long to get us down the AR rabbit hole either. So, <laughs> but I mean, to add to that, Sean, it's like it's not just the quality of the reports too. Like I said, I'm a, I, we are huge believers in, you know, having some tools so that I have something beyond reports because the problem with the reports are right, they're static. I run them, I look at them, I go do something. If I need to make notes, I need to do stuff. What am I working on? I come back later. I'm like, where's my report? I have my notes on who I was working, who I contacted, who we restate sent statements to. And I was like, really, re just really inefficient way to do it um, versus the interactive method, which is, you know, I've got a place to run AR. I put it in the, you know, in the format that I want, even a place to put notes on a per account basis. So building something that actually helps the user more effectively manage that because it is a challenge in a lot of offices. Well, it's and, and it's bigger than just being user friendly. It's really about finding the information to figure out where your efforts need to be focused. And so, no question. I didn't mean not to just they are. I mean, management right, exactly. tools are always a big right. frustration for me, particularly, you know, accounts receivable and claims management. Claims management always used to frustrate me. And I have offices, you know, back in the day here in Colorado that, you know, 56% of the revenue came from claims. I mean, they were heavily mm -hmm. in the insurance game and we go in and look and they would have hundreds of outstanding claims that hadn't been worked in months. Um, and for a couple of reasons, one, it was nobody's responsibility, right? So they, they hadn't really said, Hey, this person's going to, this is going to be run into that awesome. quite a bit. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and a lot of it, you know, being pulled in 50 different directions, but they also, at the end of the day is that the software didn't give them great tools for managing claims. So it was, the process was a process, right? So versus I could go in and say, give me all my Delta Dental and Colorado claims in age of order. Boom, look at them, make one contact, resubmit 15 claims at a time. Those are things that you could not do I mean, and, and probably still can't do in a lot of softwares. And so that managing 10, 15 overdue claims was a 90 minute process versus the 10 minute process it should be. So number one, there's two big takeaways that you just you just talked about there. So number one, you got to have one person who is responsible for something because if everybody's responsible, nobody's responsible. And if you got more than one person up front, 
and those those responsibilities aren't laid out, then again, if everybody's responsible, nobody's responsible. But the other part yeah. of that, to your point, is you got to be able to lay out those reports in a way that you can design what you need when you need it. But, and not just reports, the ability to just sit down, tell my applications, like, here's what I want, present it to me. Now let me do something with that information instead of just printing it. So, right. it, so. Yeah. Yeah. What about, um, I mean, you mentioned claims. Um, what are, what are, what are the, the claim, the, the management of those claims is a big issue that we run into all no the time. Question. Yeah. Um, what about is is um is the filing is there is there a filing part of that in terms of just getting the claims out the door mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well absolutely i mean you know almost everyone's gone electronic these days and as well they should it's more efficient uh better return you know on on your ability to get paid quicker time value money all of those things so i'm a huge proponent of it from a cost standpoint i don't care you know you can break it down however you want it's cheaper as well um there's no way that it costs less money to send a paper claim versus electronic no claims. way on earth even yeah. if you take the time factor out yeah and even if you're shoving three met lives into one envelope i i would still tell you over time it is it is cheaper to send them electronically particularly from this and here's and here's why the big thing about electronic claims right so uh, you got your application doing a test to make sure your claim information is right then you have your claims clearing house front end doing a, uh, a test to make sure that your claim is correct so that i've got subscriber IDs, dates of birth. I got surfaces on the rec, you know, on the proper codes so that I'm not finding out seven days after we did the work that my claim was incorrect. And now I've got to resubmit it, remail it. Now I'm pushing my claim out 21, 28 days exactly. before I get paid versus fixing it right on the spot, resubmitting it and getting paid the next day or, you know, 48, 72 hours. There are, there are, there are people who are listening to this who are still not a hundred percent electronic claims. And that is a big one. Uh, yes. I mean, you got to hear that. It's, it is just completely not profitable to be fooling with snail mail on these claims. Right. Um, you just introduce another excuse for the claim to not get paid on time. It's like, you know. The they'll find anything they can. They'll, yeah. I've, you know, my previous career as a business analyst, we were in the insurance business. And, you know, and we got paper claims and they went through a process. And that process could take two or th this claim needs to go to this department. This claim needs to go to this department. And sometimes it would take two, three days for the claim to even get on the right desk before it was even reviewed for payment. What I'm assuming that the dental industry has the same tricks. Totally. <laughs> and we should uh, cut that part I, I think out. that's I a safe assumption. <laughs> Listen, I, I think it's, I think it's beyond that. I mean, Hey, today's Friday. Uh, let's don't yeah, take yeah. any claims I today. Yeah, I'll get that on Monday. No. <laughs> hey, what about, um, what about insurance estimations? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. yes. <laughs> Another area of, of frustration in a lot of software. So can is I for throw something reasons. at you? Okay. Do it. This is this oh. is not this may not be specifically okay. So one of the challenges that we see on my end of the stick is um, when it comes to when it comes to insurance, um, the the lock in on the software is not at the doctor's fees it's on the individual insurances right do you follow what i'm saying absolutely we're talking about a lot of amounts um that the carrier deems as reasonable for the services that i'm providing regardless of my fee and the challenge is um that this carrier may deem this particular fee reasonable and another carrier deems the same procedure a different fee and it goes on oh, and sure. on and on and on and on right a lot of amounts are problematic from an administration standpoint for a couple of reasons. One yes. is right. I have the option of, well, I'm just going to use my fees anyway. Uh, my fee is, and we'll use an example. My service A is a hundred dollars on this insurance company allows me to charge 80. Right. And the trick becomes, well, they, they covered it at 80%, but they cover 80% of their allowed amount, not my fee. So I'm trying to estimate insurance and what should be $64 insurance estimation is $80 because I, I, my fee is a hundred. So right. my option is, well, I've got to change my fee then. Right. So my software, I have to go in and use an alternate fee schedule right. and say, well, for this carrier, I have to use a different set of fees other than my own. If I want to do accurate insurance estimating, then I lose all of my, my opportunity cost, uh, you know, between their allowed on my fee. Then I've got to somehow reverse engineer that if I want to try to figure out what this particular carrier's cost of me, 
um, to be a network. Now, I don't want to go so too deep. That's the trick. I, I don't, but, 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 but that's an issue. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and I, and I wonder how this is, if this is confusing on how it's sounding, but to take what you're saying, um, and, 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 and bring it full circle. I mean, what's happening is I got a fee that's a hundred dollars. This insurance company says it's 80. The other insurance company says it's 60. The other insurance company says it's 65 or 78 or whatever. Sure. And so it's all confusing. And, and because all of that's loaded in, most of the most of the doctors, when they look at their collection rate, it's you know it's it's at eighty percent, but it's at eighty percent of all those other things, and they lose the opportunity right. to be able to collect at their fees. Right. Um, and so, what do you think about that? Well, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that gets lost if I'm going to use alternate fee schedules, one of the things that's a key component, and in, in, in if I'm looking at maybe a practices, financial situation. I'm looking at what I'm trying to get, and you probably do this too, I'm sure, is I'm trying to figure out what their gross production is, what their, what's the cost in them, what their write-offs are, what their discounts are, and get down to net production. Then I can compare collection to that net production. But I don't have this part of the equation because I don't, I'm not accounting for it. I'm just simply Nobody's charging, accounting for it. I'm right. just charging a different fee, and that $20 difference just kind of evaporates. And so I've got an artificially high you know, I'm looking at it going, wow, my, you know, my gross and net production are, you know, they don't look, they look okay. It's like, of course they do because you're not, a, you know, you're not even taking into account that you wrote off $20 because you didn't write it off. You just didn't charge it in the first place. You're losing collection efficiency. Well, certainly the, 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 the gap, the chasm between gross and net production is greatly uh, inflated or I should say uh, understated. Understated. And you understated lose the ability to be yes. efficient at your collections because most people look at, hey, I'm collecting at 80%, but they're collecting at 80% of these numbers that are all over the board. I mean, right. you, should be at if, if, you should be at 100% with that. But, you know, uh, not, not to get off track on that, but that is a big <laughs> thing. That, you know, you and I have talked about that before. That is a big yes. deal. And when you consider this word that you throw out there, collection efficiency, that is something that we spend a lot of time on. You guys don't have to worry about that because you have you have the ability to have it built in. Well, we took a little bit different approach versus the alternate fee schedule. I mean, I went, when we sat down to look at that, one of the things that, you know, when we started developing Edison about eight years ago for in, in earnest. I mean, really getting after it and, and our, you know, and started looking into things like insurance management. And one of the things that we looked real hard at is time of collection or time of service collections and things like that. And a lot of offices, they, you know, they weren't doing a good job of it. They didn't trust their insurance estimates or unless they had a pre-auth, they weren't even really messing with it. Um, and so we spent a ridiculous amount of time working on that part of it. And we decided to do it. And, and to my knowledge, I don't, I don't think anybody else does it this way, but our, our stand was, let's do it like the insurance companies do it. Right. So your fee's $100. And it's all straightforward. It's yep. all straightforward. A lot amount is $80. We're writing off 20 and we'll base our estimates on that a lot amount. So I can produce accurate insurance estimating, right? Still post your services or your fees, know the write-off up front, and then capture that write-off when the insurance actually pays so that at the end of the day, you're like, I wonder what this particular carrier is really costing me to participate with. I can run a report and tell you precisely. Oh, yeah, and, and it's, it's costing you twenty six percent of your fees. That's what it's costing you. Yeah, and it's all straightforward. Uh, yeah. um, that, that 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 the fact that it's straightforward is the thing. If I'm listening to this, I'm driving down the road, I'm going, "Do what did they just say?" <laughs> it's straightforward. That's the key, and it's yeah. not. And and for the front desk people who are listening to this, they they understand it's not straightforward. What you're talking about is a very straightforward. You got the debits and the credits, and they all match up, and everything backs out. And it look, and there it is. It's a straightforward right. approach. I got my fee. I got the insurance fee. I got the write-off. I got the pay. Yeah. It's all there. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just math if you have all the variables. The problem is not everyone has all the variables, so they can't do all the math. Because it's not so, straightforward. Yeah. How many times have you been in an office, Sean? I know that I've seen this where patients, you know, checking out, and the, and the adding machine starts going. Oh, absolutely. Like trying to, I mean, hang on, I'll tell you what, what I want to collect today. And, and how silly is that? Think about that. Now, how silly is that? In 2018, with all of the computing power that should be available, I mean, you should be able to just go, boom, there it is. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a matter of if you capture the data, you put in good information, if your allowed amounts are entered, um, your software should be able to produce very accurate insurance estimating. Now, there are variables that we don't, you know, we can't control, like, 
you use part of your coverage down the street at the periodontist and things like that. But for the most part, those are the exceptions. So, all right. So let me tell you a big challenge I have. Okay. One of the biggest challenges that we run into all the time is just the simple getting the data. Right. They're just, just, just yeah. getting the information. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've just, you know, just, okay, let me jump in. Okay, just let me do it. And I jump in, right. and I'm trying to pull the reports and all that. And that's a big, hairy deal. Oh, yeah. I've worked with hundreds of practices that were working with consultants. And, you know, just to watch them go through the data collection part of it was amazing to me. It's like, really? I mean, I had an office that, you know, they were working with, you know, um, uh, some consultants out of Arizona that, you know, they had some significant data requirements. And they literally had an office person that spent 8 to 10 hours a week gathering this data, 8 to 10 hours a week. Wow. Because they had to run 50 different reports and then piece two things together and things like that. So, I mean, <laughs> it is the, yeah, the, the consultant's dilemma, right? It's like um, what we do is pretty straightforward, but getting the data that we need to arrive at, you know, some kind of answer is, is the problem. And I've seen firsthand that what you've developed makes that very, again, straightforward. In a lot of regards, yeah. So, you know, producing data about what you produce, what you collect, you know, insurance write-offs, all that information is is relatively straightforward. Uh, producing an AR, how many hours did I work in what time frame, what's my production look like in that time frame, et cetera. So. So, so, Rusty, the thing that makes it work is the fact that, you know, you, as the developer, are thinking like a business person rather than a developer at the end of the day. Oh, no question. It's the culmination of being in hundreds of dental offices for an extended, you know, over a debt, I mean, 12, 13 years of doing that stuff um, before we started working with, you know, work developing Edison. Um, and along the way, you know, lots of mental notes about why I don't like that or doctors, front office people, hygienist assistants telling me, well, what it should do is this. And that kind of thing. Even after we started building it, you know, we, a couple of times we, we kind of went down the, you know, the wrong path and uh, we had a lot of users that were quick to say, here's what you should have done. <laughs> that kind of thing. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the thing that's different about the way Edison was built is that I'm not a, I'm not a programmer. You know, I've worked with them in my career, but we, the way we built it was different. We built, we literally built all the screens first and then reverse engineer all the programming. In other words, we built what the, what we wanted, what output we wanted. And then we took it to the developer. How do you said, get there? Right. No, I, I don't, I don't, I want the most efficient way, you know, we can to do this, but at the end of the day, this is what I want because my, I learned early in my career, developers will always take the programming path of least resistance. But if you right. just say, Hey, I need, you know, I need to figure out how many sheep are in that field. Uh, so create an algorithm and they'll go, okay. And they'll come back with, we figured it out. We're counting legs. We're dividing by four. And now we got the number. <laughs> okay. We're counting legs. And dividing by four. <laughs> <laughs> that even got Mr. Producer cracking up back there. But anyway, it's a whole different story. So, but yeah, I literally had a developer I worked with. I called him the shepherd because that was every time I come back, I'm like, Wow, you took the long way around the barn to get there. Let's, you know. <laughs> no, but we literally, you know, it's like, let's. Here's what I want my schedule to look like. Here's all the functionality precisely that I want it to do. I want to be able to do this. I want it to be able to do that. I do not, you know, and, and so don't say, "Hey, here's your scheduler." Right. You know. Right. Yeah. Here's my development tools that I had that make scheduling easier. It's like, yeah, that's all fine. I want it to work precisely this way. Same with our accounting, you know, our, our account ledger screens, our insurance screens. We built them all to look, you know, what the, the prototype them up precisely. And then we started to develop the actual doing the behind the scenes stuff, which, you know, typically the process is different, right? You start building your tables and all of your, um, you know, your algorithms and all that stuff. And then we add a front end when we get it all put together. We, we went the other, we kind of did it. No, I'm, I'm, I mean, even from a layperson standpoint, what you're saying makes total sense. See how that's good because I was worried about that. No, I <laughs> no, I can see. Well, as I was saying it, I'm like, oh, okay. no, I can see how that's how that's backwards, man. That makes total yeah, sense. Yeah. So if I'm listening to this, here's what I'm taking away: really good stuff, man. Number one, I need to be able to look at my software and make it do what I want it to do. And the second thing that I'm taking away, if you're listening to this, is 
is when you get back and you're running a report, let's call it AR. Uh, when, you're, when you're running that report, you need to dive in and make sure that what you think you're looking at is what you really are, is the knowledge that you need. And then question that a little bit before you go focus um, on what it is that you need to change. Make sure that the information you're looking at is what sure. you need it to be. And that's a big one because I find that most of the time it's really not. Um, it's all about collection efficiency and profitability. And I think that's the biggest takeaway that, that you know, we talk about this a lot, Rusty, um, on all of our channels. Uh, you know, in, America's the greatest country on earth. And anybody who wants to get credentialed and wants to get the designation after their name to, to do dentistry or to become a doctor or do all of those things, at the end of the day, they became a doctor because they like to do doctor stuff. They got into dentistry because they like to do dental stuff. But but one of the biggest things that's, that's a great takeaway from this conversation is production doesn't equal profitability. No, no. And no. you've got to have the proper step knowledge. one. Right, step one. And, you know, and we had this conversation, Sean. One of the things that you know, I run it. I talk to dentists all the time about you know, I, I talk about profitability factors. And what I find in most dentists, and, and I'm sure you have too, is that when we start talking about profitability, they, they, they've already taken a look at the production, but then they immediately fall down to okay, profitability, overhead. And that's right where they go, right? The first thing we look at is what's my overhead look like? And at the end of the day, if I'm really breaking down the numbers, it's the last thing I look at because right. it has the least impact on profitability. Unless you're grossly overpaying people or paying too much for rent or you know whatever, um, I, can, I find the least amount of opportunity in that category. I go back up to What's my collection efficiency? What's my, you know, what's my true net production? And those are my areas um, that ha generally will yield the, the most amount of opportunity in terms of boosting that bottom line. And this is why, this is why I, you and I get along so well because we think alike. Um, that is just the bottom line at the end of the day. That's yeah, a mathematical uh, certainty, Sean. It, 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 <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that is one of the most important things that, that you could hear. Uh, if you're listening to this, if you are trying to grow your business before you go to the overhead, that's like the very last thing you do because there are so many, in some, in some cases millions, of ways that you can grow this business, none of which have anything to do with your overhead. And very little impact can yeah. be done to your bottom line on that overhead. But when you talk about collection efficiency, when you talk about profitability, when you talk about AR management and all the things that you just spoke about, that's where the growth of the business really, right. really lives. And that's that where is the, opportunity the biggest is. takeaway. Yep. That's where the opportunity is. The director of Edison Dental, Rusty Bradbury. Rusty, I really appreciate what you're bringing to the table. You know, I'd like to maybe have you back and let's, let's maybe get some, uh, some graphics up there so we can actually <laughs> talk about some stuff moving forward. Sure. Absolutely. Be happy uh, to. Listen, I, I very much appreciate you spending the time again those are the biggest takeaways, the last thing you said. If I want to grow my business, it has very little, if anything, to do with my overhead. It's all of these other things first. When I've maximized all those, if I want to take a look at overhead, why not? Yeah, but if I'm, I'm losing, if I'm losing yeah. dollars, it does me no good uh, to work on the pennies. Right. That's at, exactly right. At, at the end of the day. Um, what you've done, my friend, I have been – you've been in dentistry for 21 years. I've been in dentistry for the same amount of time, maybe a little longer. And I have yet to find a practice management software that does all of the things that you developed that you're talking about here. And I appreciate the straight out information that you brought to the table, Rusty. Thank you for joining us. That's my pleasure, Sean. Thank you. We'll see you next time. This has been Dental Profits, where it's all about you having happier clients, better results, making more money, and enjoying the ride. And that's what we want for you. I'm Sean Crabtree. See you next week. Thank you.